So I'll just uh, get started first with introduction to the course. Um, this is going to be a, an approximately two hour course on IAC fundamentals of ROS2 and AutoWare, um, a crash course and hopefully how not to crash. Uh, for those of you who haven't met me before, um, my name is Josh Whitley. I am the owner and founder of Whitley Software Services, and I'm currently the full-time system arch architect for the AutoWare Foundation. Um, and that picture on the right is of me and my wife, Kathy. And Kathy uh, owns a reptile breeding operation, which is where I got uh, Brock and all of our reptiles that we have. We have almost 100 now. So. Um, Let's start with a, a very high level introduction of what Ross is. And uh, for those of you who have an idea of what Ross is, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, hopefully we will be able to uh, add a few pieces of useful information. Um, I would ask that, uh, that any of you joining, please mute your microphones so we don't get any background information, uh, background sound. So uh, starting from an incredibly high level, what is ROS and ROS2? So ROS stands for the Robotic Operating System. And uh, it was created originally in 2007 by a group called Willow Garage. Uh, they were on the East Coast and they spun out of one of the major universities there. It was a, a group of about 10 people. And now the uh, Willow Garage eventually evolved into what is now Open Robotics, which is the, the Open Source Robotics Foundation and the uh, Open Source Robotics Corporation. Um, they are the stewards of ROS. So they, they don't officially make ROS. Um, they, they help manage the core repositories of ROS and uh, moving the operating system forward. Um, but ROS in general is developed and maintained by the whole robotics and ROS community. So it, it is not something where, you know, uh, Open Robotics is releasing a version of ROS and you're kind of stuck with what you get. It is completely open source. Um, they have very detailed discussions when someone wants to make a change to ROS about why and what the rest, how it affects the rest of the uh, architecture and so on. And that's why they are kind of the stewards of, of ROS because they understand a lot about the entire architecture and how changes are made. Um, ROS is currently used in lots of places in production and research and development applications. So there are a lot, there's a whole ROS industrial group that specifically deals with uh, ROS on industrial robots and industrial settings. So there are many factories, um, big names that you've probably heard of that, that use ROS in their robotic systems for their automated production lines. Um, but outside of that, uh, it's used for everything from hobby uh, robots all the way up to like um, complex autonomous systems, which is kind of what we're talking about today. And in general, uh, ROS is really a messaging and communication architecture. So it's a set of, um, uh, applications that run on uh, different systems. You can run it on uh, Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. Um, the Mac OS support is, will, be, will be dropping at the next version, but currently you can still run it on Mac OS. Um, well, it's, sorry? Uh, downgraded to tier three, but there's still an uh, active community and a lot of people are using it on Mac OS, including the new M1s. Gotcha, thanks for the clarification. Yep. Um, so in addition to being a messaging and communication architecture, it also has language APIs uh, that we'll talk a little bit more in detail about later that allow you to access that messaging and communication architecture and send messages back and forth. Um, outside of the core ROS, uh, and it, it includes lots of drivers for, for many different pieces of hardware that take the data from those pieces of hardware and convert them into something ROS can understand. And we'll talk a little bit about what in IEC is currently supported with uh, ROS drivers that are available. It has a ton of different utilities available for it, things uh, from you know, just on the command line, being able to query the data that's being sent, uh, look at the message structures, um, gathering information about the transforms that are being published, uh, up to like creating dynamic complex graphs and uh, charts of the data that are being published. 
Um, and that's where the, the GUI tools comes in. There are a lot of uh, uh, graphical user interface tools that are based on uh, mostly on Q, on the QT or Qt architecture, but they allow you to um, visualize the data and uh, make it really easy to understand in a visual way. And then there's a ton of documentation and we'll get into a little bit of the documentation here shortly um, that's available through uh, ROS. So these are a lot of the high level uh, ROS2 features. ROS2 has more than just this, but these were the main ones that I figured uh, for, for an introduction, it was easy to kind of explain these. Some of the more detailed ones, you kind of have to understand um, the APIs and how to, how to connect to them to get a context for what they are. Uh, but in the beginning, uh, pub sub is, the, is one of the major features and that allows you to publish data from one piece of software to another and the other piece of software can subscribe to that data and be notified every time new data is published on the topic. And this public uh, pub sub architecture is also a one to many architecture. So you can have one node publishing information on a topic and then as many other nodes subscribing to that data as you want in the ROS architecture. Um, it also has uh, APIs for creating and receiving parameters at runtime. So you can set parameters on node start, like if you're starting up a, uh, let's say like a GNSS driver, for example. Um, if you're connecting via ethernet, the, the driver needs to know what IP address and what port to connect to and what messages to expect from the GNSS driver. And those are the examples of sorts of things that you would apply as parameters on your driver node, and it can receive those at runtime. But the other nice thing in ROS2 is that those are also modifiable during runtime. So let's say that you have a control algorithm and uh, you have a PID loop in that control algorithm. You can set some initial values for that PID loop when you start the node. And then while you're running the node, you can go in and dynamically modify those parameters and see how the uh, control algorithm reacts in real time. So it's a very um, handy uh, uh, tuning tool. Uh, another feature that ROS2 offers is called services. So PubSub is a, a public architecture for uh, publishing data and then receiving it in other nodes. Services are where you directly connect from one node to another and you make a request of the node that hosts the service. So let's say you are recording a, a set of waypoints and um, at a certain point, you want the waypoints to be saved from that node. You can set up a service on that node that uh, you can call at any time. And when you make the call to that service, you can provide a piece of information and say, here's the path to the file I want you to save the waypoints in. And that service will run in the node, uh, save the waypoints to that file, and then return a status saying, yes, I either did this correctly or I failed to do this. And then kind of combining the services and pub sub is what's called actions. So you can, these are more for like long-term running processes. So for example, if you want to have a single planning node, um, have the vehicle navigate from one location to another, that's not something where you can really just, you know, make a single call and expect to get something back quickly. So the actions allow you to make a request. And then as the request is being handled by the, by the server of the action, uh, you get real time feedback. It'll tell you, you know, this is my current location over and over again until the task completes. And then when the task completes, it'll give you either a, a success or failure status. Um, in addition to that, all of these have uh, quality of service settings, which allow you to tell the node, um, I want this pub sub connection to be reliable, which means uh, when you send data across the pub sub connection, you can tell it, I want you to uh, verify that that data was received on the other end. And if it wasn't, retransmit up to X number of times uh, to make sure that the data are received. Um, you can also tell it uh, how large you'd like the queues to be. So um, if you want to make sure that data are received on the other end, you can make a, a queue of, you know, 20 or 40 messages. And if the other node is not running fast enough to process all those messages as they come in, 
uh, that queue will store messages until the node is ready for them to be processed. And then finally, you can, uh, you can set a quality of service setting called um, uh, transient local. And essentially that means that when you publish a piece of data on a topic, it latches that data so that any new subscribers that subscribe to that topic will automatically receive that piece of information, even if it was transmitted before they subscribe to it. Um, there's also runtime node aggregation. Uh, they call these components in ROS, and they essentially allow you to take uh, five or six different nodes that you're running in ROS and combine them all into a single process so that it's uh, they're sharing memory and CPU um, uh, resources among those nodes. Um, so this lets you dynamically choose how to do that at runtime. You can group them in whatever order makes sense for the functions that the nodes uh, are doing. And then um, finally, one of the, the, the more complex features to use in ROS is called uh, node lifecycle management. And so node lifecycle management lets you set up a set of callbacks within your code um, so that every time you transition the node from one stage to the next, uh, the callback gets processed. And this way you can break down the uh, startup and the running of that node into several different stages and be confident about what stage that node is currently in. Um, by the way, we will have a Q&A kind of at the end of this. So feel free to, to put your questions in chat or um, uh, once we get to the Q&A, you can unmute yourself and, and ask a question and we'll uh, I'll try and get to as many of those as I can. So um, you might be asking what the two on the end of ROS2 means if you haven't heard of ROS before. And there was a ROS1, um, but it was just called ROS. Uh, so ROS2 is really like a complete rewrite of ROS. And it's based on um, a different underlying uh, uh, standard called DDS. So there, there are lots of um, message marshalling systems out there that let you pass messages back and forth. But DDS is a, uh, a standardized implementation of how you write a message communication architecture. And ROS actually lets you choose what implementation of DDS you want to use. So there are uh, implementations like Cyclone DDS, um, which is from the Eclipse Foundation and is open source. Um, there's RTI Connect. There's ePROSIMA Fast DDS. Um, and a couple others. And there's actually a new one coming out uh, very shortly that um, will be made available to the ROS community and is, uh, is real-time certified. Um, the rewrite of ROS also included more concise APIs, uh, more documentation. It's, it's more performant than the first ROS. It's more real-time and it's kind of a little bit more of everything. Um, it's, it's a much more organized and uh, complete architecture than the original ROS was because the original ROS kind of grew out of this, this group of guys just doing robotics for their own purposes. And now that the ROS community has been established and um, the uh, open robotics has a better idea of what use cases ROS is being used for, uh, they were able to re-architect it in a way that, that makes it more flexible and more applicable to those use cases. So there are um, what are called ROS compatibility layers that allow you to write code for ROS in many different languages. So the two primary uh, fully supported languages are C++14 and Python 3. Um, and they target Python 3.8 for the current version. But there are many more community supported compatibility layers out there for C and C++ and Java and JavaScript and uh, the JVM from Android. Node.js, Objective-C on iOS. So you can write applications that run on your PC and also have a, a component on your cell phone that can communicate with each other through ROS. Um, so it's a highly flexible system. So let's talk a little bit about what ROS2 packages and nodes mean. Um, when you write a, uh, a component in ROS, it's called a node. And when you want to package up that node or multiple nodes and make them available to other people, uh, the ROS software has to understand like what its dependencies are and um, how, to, how to build it and those sorts of things. And that, uh, those are defined in a package. So we're actually gonna dig into a couple of the examples here um, 
some from C++ and some from Python. Um, I'm going to start with the C++ ones because uh, AutoWare is written C++ and C++ is really more of a real-time language that's um, a little bit better suited for things like automotive applications. But the Python versions are, are just as valid. They, they simply aren't um, as designed for real time as the C++ languages. So I'm going to switch over to, uh, to my browser real quick. And we'll kind of just go through real quick what a node looks like in ROS and C++. So the, uh, this is the RCLCPP, or the ROS compatibility layer for uh, C++ or excuse me, ROS client library, not compatibility layer. So ROS client library for C++. And this is the API that you would use to create a node. So this, just like any other class in C++, um, it's got constructors. And when you create a node, you give it a, a string name of the node, and then you give it a, a, what's called a node options object. And that node options object can define things like parameters that you want to pass in or, um, what namespace you want to use for the node, or basically anything that you can define within the node, you can also pass in as part of the node options object. And the advantage to that is that you can then, uh, you know, create multiple levels of inheritance and have the same node options object pass through all of them. So they all maintain the same state and receive the same options when they start up. Um, of course, it's got some, some standard calling functions for getting the name, the namespace, the getting a logger, and uh, we'll, we may or may not talk a little bit about logging, but there's a whole logging system associated with, uh, with ROS2. And then some of the important ones here that you'll be using um, every day would be functions like create publisher and create subscription. Hey, Josh, so, yeah. can, can you bump up your font size? This is illegible on a Zoom screen share. There, how's that? More. One more. Oops, too far. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. OK. Um, so yeah, creating a publisher uh, allows you to take the node and have it create um, a, a, a publisher object that will publish to a specific topic. So you give it the topic name, and it will create uh, a C++ object, which allows you to create a message and then publish it to that topic. Um, creating a, a subscription is essentially the opposite of that. You create a, uh, a you, you give it the topic of uh, the name of the topic that you want to subscribe to, and then you create a callback. And every time new data is published to that topic, your callback gets called. So you can process the data that's coming in. So it's, it's a pretty simple um, set of functions that you use to create a node to talk to each other. Uh, the, the API is, is pretty simplistic. And then uh, client and service are for doing services that I mentioned earlier. So a service is the server for the service. You give it a service name, and then you create a callback. Uh, the client is someone who's calling the service. So you give it the same service name. Um, you can give it a QoS profile if you want. And when you are ready to call the service, you use that client to make a call to the service, and then the service returns something. So again, pretty simplistic. Um, the parameters that I was mentioning earlier, this is how you declare parameters on your node. You call declare parameter. You tell it the parameter name you want to provide and the type that you want it to be, whether it's a string or a float or a uint, whatever you want. And uh, once that parameter is declared, it will then be accepted at runtime when you pass it in through either a YAML file or through a, a command line. And then while the system is running, you can get the parameters back. And then um, you also can set the on parameters callback. So this means, uh, as I was saying before about being able to change the parameters uh, real time during runtime, this is where you handle any of those changes. So when someone makes a change to the parameter externally, the node has to understand what do you want to do when that change happens. And this is where you set up your callback to be able to do that. So um, this is the, the basic API for, uh, for nodes. Um, we'll, we'll show just a quick example of what a talker node would look like. And that would be uh, essentially a node that uh, publishes data on a topic. So um, as with any good C++ uh, application, you should have namespaces. 
and the namespaces help keep your nodes and other nodes from having naming collisions. Um, you create a class and then you inherit from the RCLCPP node API that I was showing earlier. Uh, within that, you um, instantiate your talker class and you pass it a set an RCLCPP node options object. And then that node options object also gets passed up to the parent class, the node. Then to publish the message, uh, you essentially create a publisher. And in this case, they're creating a, a Lambda function and we, it's called publish message. So it's a simple Lambda function that uh, creates a copy of a uh, std messages string. And the std messages part is just a, a core set of messages that are available from ROS2. Uh, they include basic things like strings and floats and uints and all the, all the, uh, uh, the base types. And you create a copy of that and then you pop, uh, populate the data object of that message with the string that you want to publish. And then as I was mentioning earlier, the, the, this is part of the logging. Uh, so you can log at any point at different levels like info and warning and error. And you have to have a logger object from the class in order to do that. And then you tell it what, uh, what log message you wanna publish. And then finally, you take the publisher, in this case, it's just called pub underscore, and you publish the message to it. So this one's a little bit out of order since they created the, uh, the uh, Lambda function first, which actually does the publishing. But here is how you create the publisher. You um, take an object and you make it equal to this create publisher. You tell it what type of messages you're going to publish on that topic. You give it the topic name, and then you set a quality of service settings. In this case, they want to make sure that they keep the last seven messages that were received in a queue so that they can be uh, recalled if necessary. And then for this particular use case, they created a timer and the node API also has a function called create wall timer, which means you don't have to mess with chrono or setting up any of your own uh, timing settings or anything. You just tell it, I wanna create a timer and I want it to run on this interval. And every time that timer is triggered, here's the function I wanna call. And in this case, it's a reference to that Lambda function publish message. So that's pretty much it. This is what a basic node looks like in, uh, in the RCL CPP API for ROS. Um, you, you might be asking yourself where the main function is. And the answer is that this is uh, written as a component, which means that you can essentially tell ROS in, the, uh, in your CMake file, how, when, it's, when you're telling it how to build this node on this package, that you want it to automatically create an executable for this, uh, this class. You tell it what class you want to create the executable for, and it automatically does it. So you don't have to create your own main function. It's just there already. So we'll really quickly go through the, the listener node example. Um, and basically, this is uh, very similar to the, the, the talker. But the, the major difference is um, they use the, the Lambda function as a callback for when they receive data, rather than publishing the data with it. So once they receive the data, in this case, they just log it and say, uh, here's the data that I received on this message. So once you have that callback function created, you just call create subscription, tell it what message type it's expecting to receive, give it the topic name that you're gonna be receiving it on. Uh, in this case, this is a, a placeholder for the QoS and this basically just tells it create a basic QoS object with a uh, 10, 10, size 10 Q and then here's the callback I want to call. So again, it's pretty simplistic. The, uh, the API is, is very uh, friendly. And again, this is also registered as a component. So you don't have to worry about creating your executable. And the component API is the one that lets you, allows you to combine multiple nodes into a single running process. So all of that's kind of done automatically. And then finally, for the C++, we'll go through uh, what, a, what a basic package looks like. So those examples that we were looking at are in the source folder of this demo node CPP package. And the main things that differentiate a package from just a set of C++ files is the CMakeList.txt file, 
which describes how we want CMake and the, uh, the Colcon build system, which is what ROS2 uses, to build this package. So in CMake lists, um, you can see we tell it we want to use C14. And then we have to find package each of the dependencies for this package so that it knows where to get them and how to build, uh, build against them. And then the executables, um, you just run uh, the standard CMake add executable, and then you use a function called amend target dependencies to tell it how to link against those dependencies that you found packaged earlier. You tell it where you want to install it, and that's pretty much it. You end it with, uh, you end it with amend package. And the amend package is where everything gets built together and it registers itself with the ROS package index. And then finally, the other thing that differentiates uh, a ROS package from most other collections of C++ classes is a package.xml file. And this package.xml file is used for automatic dependency resolution and being able to build the, uh, the package on the ROS build farm if you want. So if you want to make this package available as, for example, in Ubuntu, you can use a uh, sudo apt install the package name. It has to be available on the ROS build farm so that it gets into a uh, package repository from ROS. And then you can just sudo apt install ROS, the name of the uh, distribution of ROS that you're going for, in this case, Foxy. So ROS, Foxy, and then your package name. And it will automatically uh, download and install the package for you. So you can set dependencies of different types. So this means that the dependency is required at build time. This means the dependency is required when you actually execute it. And this means the dependency is only required when running tests on your package. And there's also a whole testing framework available as well for ROS, uh, ROS2. So now we'll, uh, we'll also really quickly go through the Python API. Um, again, this is, this is very similar to the C++ API. You'll recognize a lot of similar things here. Um, looking at the, the Node API, uh, you've got RCLPy instead of RCLCPP. So this is the Python uh, ROS uh, compatibility layer. I know I'm saying that wrong. It's the other one, but I can't remember it offhand. Um, so from RCLPy.Node, you would import the Node class. And then when you create a node object, you can give it a node name. Uh, you can give it optionally some other things like context and uh, namespace, use global arguments, et cetera. And then once you've created the node, you can also create things like topics from it. So uh, in the case of uh, RCLPy, you don't actually use the node object. You just use rclpy.publisher.publisher. .publisher. So you create the publisher, uh, and then you, you tell it what message type you want and the topic that you want to send it to. And then again, the QoS profile, if you want to apply that. You can also do things like asking how many people, how many other nodes are currently subscribed to this, uh, this topic. And then the publish function is the, the same as the C++ API. Uh, you give it the message that you want to publish, and it will publish the message to that topic. So the example talker um, will have a lot of similar structure to, to the, uh, the Python API, or excuse me, the C++ API. Uh, the difference here is that you, you do create a main option because the, the Python API doesn't currently have the ability to use uh, components. So you create a talker class, which inherits from the node class. Um, you initialize it using a copy of self, just like with every other, uh, every other Python uh, class. And then you call super.init, which will call the, the node cons, uh, constructor, and you pass it the name of what you want this node to be. You then also create the publisher, uh, in this case, self.pub, giving it the type and the name, as well as the QoS of the publisher you want to create. And then again, this creates a timer. So uh, you give it a timer period, in this case, one second. And then you tell it, I want to call this timer callback function every time the timer is ticked. So the timer callback, again, creates an object of type string. It sets the data of that object and then um, uses the logger to say that, you know, I'm publishing this piece of information and then calls self.pub.publish this message. 
So this is the class that you would be instantiating as the node. And then in your main function, uh, you'd call rclpy.init, which tells it, uh, I want to initialize the rclpy infrastructure. You create an instance of the talker, and then you call rclpy.spin. And spin just basically means that uh, you're going to take the node and have it uh, run in a loop over and over again. And process any incoming data as well as uh, uh, starting the timer. Once that is done spinning, which means you've shut down the node with like uh, control C on the terminal or something, um, you would call node.destroy node and rclpy.shutdown. Very similarly, the, the listener looks almost identical. Again, creating a node from a listener class. Um, you create it exactly the same way and pass it the name listener instead of talker this time. And then instead of a publisher, you create a subscriber. Again, you tell it what type of uh, message you're going to be listening for, what the name of the topic is going to be, and the callback that you want it to call whenever it receives data on this topic. And then again, just as with the C++ API, this uh, logs the information that it receives on every message that's, that's received on that uh, topic. And then the, the main function looks exactly the same as it did for the uh, talker. So the only difference with a Python package versus a C++ package, um, you still have the package.xml file that's required for every package, regardless of what type. But then instead of a CMake file, you have a setup.py. And the setup.py defines the package name, uh, the version that you are going to be releasing, um, and this is where you do your dependencies list. Uh, you have to define some extra data files for a pure Python package, and then you tell it what Python packages are required in order to build this. In this case, setup tools is the only Python package required. Um, you give it some information, uh, which is duplicated in the package.xml file, so that Python uh, has the same data, and then um, you tell it what nodes are available and what those entry point functions are in the nodes to be able to launch them from the command line. So that is the Python API and the C++ API for uh, ROS2. Um, now we'll, we'll stop for a few minutes and, and just take some questions. If any of you would like to uh, unmute yourself to ask a question, please feel free to do so. And don't be afraid. I'm not scary, I promise. Josh, Jack Silverman, thanks for taking the time to doing this. Quick question in terms of um, measuring performance and of code. What are the tools available in ROS2 so that the code real time is real time? So the real time requirements um, come mostly down to the, the DDS implementation and the uh, configuration of ROS2. So you can do some. Um, uh, performance analytics associated with the, the, the pub sub, and you can tell it either inside the node code or, or you can um, um, profile the code from outside, basically asking, you know, how often am I actually publishing this data and how often is it actually being received? But when it comes down to setting up the system for real time, uh, that comes down to mostly DDS configuration. And we actually have uh, Joe Speed on the call, who is uh, one of the people who helps maintain Cyclone DDS. And he should actually be able to get you in touch with the developers of Cyclone DDS that can help you configure uh, the DDS system for real-time performance. But I do want to mention that um, when it comes to real-time, uh, ROS is not the only component in that stack, right? So your, right, operating, right. System, uh, your operating system plays into that a lot, too. So if you want to be truly real time, um, if you're using something like Linux or uh, you, you really want like a kernel with real time extensions or even uh, like a real time operating system like QNX. Right, right. So I, I would imagine that. So I was more on the, the code for the real time in this, let's say, with one second, right? With a certain period of time, you can call right. that real time, yep. right? And then I was trying to figure out if there was a way that you can actually then either measure that to not meeting that real time window that you call um, and then find out what components are not allowed to do that in ROS, just like as an 
are yep. taught allowed to do it. That's one. The second question, I guess, maybe with this and also that QoS, do you have to set then the priorities for the QoS similar to what you say, okay, this is voice, then going to be highest priority than something else similar so to what you're doing the, the is there are only uh, a few levels of priority that you can set in the QoS settings. So there's um, there's reliable, which attempts to retransmit, and there's best effort, which means that essentially the data is being transmitted, and if you get it, you get it. There's no uh, uh, there's no verification that the data is is being received. And um, the the idea is that. Um, Everything's processed in a queue. You can't have multiple things running simultaneously. So it's essentially uh, first come, first serve. It's a first in, first out queue for all of the messages. So there's no real priority associated with it because it's just first in, first out. Um, so there are a few other questions coming in on chat. Uh, will we have the chance to access the recording? Yes, absolutely. We will have the recording available as soon as uh, the video is done being processed. Um, let's see, Haru asked, are there quick ways to configure setup.py or CMake uh, file? Can they be automatically generated using some tool? Uh, actually, that's a good question. And there is a, a really simple um, uh, utility called um, Immense CMake Auto. And Immense CMake Auto makes the, the whole process for defining a CMake file much, much simpler. So let's look at an example of uh, one that's in AutoWare. So let me zoom way in on this. And go to source. And we'll just pick like any uh, any package in AutoWare Auto, because all of them use uh, AutoWare Auto, uh, Immense CMake, Immense CMake Auto. So Immense CMake Auto, here's an example of what a package would look like with that. Um, you give it the, the CMake required version, you tell it the project, you tell it to find package Immense CMake Auto uh, so that it knows how to use the, the macros in that. And then you call emit auto find build dependencies. So instead of find packaging each of those packages independently, this actually parses the package.xml file and will automatically find package each of the packages that's in there. Um, and then if you're, if you're doing build testing, which you generally want to do, it builds all of the tests for the package, uh, you can also use emit lint auto find test dependencies. So that will go through all the test dependencies and find them automatically for you. And then Ament Auto Package does a whole bunch of stuff. So uh, if you've got an include folder, it automatically installs the include folder with your package so that other uh, packages can use it. It automatically exports all of your dependencies to downstream packages. It automatically installs any uh, executables or libraries that you create in this package. It does a whole bunch of that stuff without you ever having to write a single extra line of CMake. So that was a good question. Um, let's see. Can, can we also get the slides? Yes, absolutely. Those will be available with, uh, Joe also put a link in there. The slides are available currently, but they will also be available at the recording. Yep, they're um, in the chat. Python code be compiled to ROS2 components, or does this only work for C++? Right now, there is no component API for the Python uh, RCL Pi. So unfortunately, yes, that only works for C++. Um, I think there is a, an outstanding issue on the RCL Pi repository to, to make that possible. But it's a lot more complex to do in, um, in Python because of the ability to handle threading and such more easily in, uh, in C++. Um, let's see. Could you give an example of services or nodes in the parking or delivery ODD context? Uh, so this is uh, somewhat related to the, the autoware stuff we're gonna get uh, into in a little bit. And um, that is uh, a good question. I can give an example of those. Um, let me find one real quick. So we used services uh, pretty heavily in the autonomous valley parking demonstration that we did. And I'll show an example of that AVP demo a little bit later. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think of where we used those. 
Mapping is a good example of that. So um, we created a, a Lanelet2 map provider and the, the map provider has a service on it where you can say, I want a piece of the map that is within these geographic coordinates. And then the service will return you back uh, a Lanelet2 map that is just within those bounds that you provided. So the Lanelet2 map provider, There's a few uh, few files in here and it's kind of hard to see. HUD map service. Okay, here we go. So here's an example. Uh, we create a map service. We call this create service. We tell it we want the service to be uh, of a service type HAD map service. And then this is the name of the service. And this service name has to be shared between the, uh, the, the service provider and the service client. And then we bind that uh, to a callback function. So the handle request function within this class is uh, the one that's going to handle the incoming requests for this service. So there's a quick example of that in the uh, AutoWare context. Uh, for porting ROS1 code to ROS2, there are tools. Oh, that was from Joe. Um, how does Windows OS fit in? So Windows, o Windows is one of the uh, tier one supported platforms for ROS2. And it uses uh, a service called Chocolatey for dependency resolution. So you essentially run, um, uh, you, you can install ROS inside of uh, Windows in using uh, MinGW, which allows you to use kind of a bash shell within Windows and use Chocolatey for dependency resolution. So it is possible to run many ROS nodes on Windows in addition to Linux. Yeah, real quick, Steve Cox, that was my question, which is me trying to wrap my mind around uh, where the development, you know, uh, is going. It looks like this is primarily, and what I think Joe Speed just said, uh, this is going to be uh, everything running on, on Linux. Mm -hmm. So we need to basically be prepared in the future, our team anyway, for uh getting all this to run on on Linux. Is that correct? So I would say for IAC, yes, that's correct. OK. All right, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. Can I ask a question uh, on interfacing with the SVL simulator, or is that something we cover later in the workshop? Um, I'm not covering the SVL simulator at this point, so feel free to post that in chat. And there will be a second Q&A session like right at the end uh, where I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that, if that's all right with you. Okay, um, and with that, given that uh, we're a little bit time constrained, we will um, go ahead and uh, take a little break uh, of about 10 minutes. So we will come back at five till the hour. Thank you all for joining. So Josh, what is that, those fancy rigs behind you? <laughs> so um, for anyone else who's wondering, these are, uh, Com the computers that will be part of the IAC race cars. They are the AD Link AVA 3501s. Uh, they have a multi core Intel uh, Xeon processor in them, as well as a uh, very high end NVIDIA graphics card. And uh, I've been using them for a uh, trying to set up a simulation in the loop uh, environment where uh, one of those is running um, the LG uh, SVL SIM, and it will be outputting uh, real time the data that it's receiving uh, in, a, in the exact same format that it would be coming from the sensors. And then that will be transmitted over the wire to the other machine. And that machine will be running AutoWare as if it was receiving the data directly from the sensors. So is this the one that uh, uh, Joe is sending to me just testing or Joe gonna send something different, I guess? Uh, is, is this is this the units, uh, Joe? Just to be a total open, are these the units that you sent to Josh to test before sent to me then, or something like that? No, you'll probably get the Ross cubes, which is its baby brother. <laughs> the um, the IAC computer is a little bit large and a little bit hungry for your know, EV I, Grand Prix go kart. I know, but I have to start some of this conversation. <laughs> and uh, and it would squash your F one tenth cars. It, All right. That, that is the rig that uh, Madur, so University of Virginia Cavalier IAC team, um, they're getting a pair of those to set up the 
uh, to set up the software in the loop, hardware in the loop, test rig like Josh has. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what AutoWare is. Um, we've been talking about ROS and ROS2, and AutoWare is uh, built on top of ROS and ROS2. So this is sort of an extension of the previous conversation. Um, so we'll start with some boring stuff first. You know, what is the AutoWare Foundation? Uh, we are kind of like to AutoWare what Open Robotics is to ROS. We are the stewards of AutoWare. We uh, we help guide where AutoWare is going and uh, what's going to be added to it next, but we are not the owners. The community is the owners of AutoWare. Um, originally, uh, AutoWare was started as something called AutoWare AI, which was based on ROS1. Um, that was started back in 2015 by Shinpei Kato at Nagoya University. Um, AutoWare AI is, is currently supported uh, on a huge number of platforms and runs on a bunch of different vehicles. Um, there are AutoWare courses, et cetera, that are based on it, but really mostly what we're going to be talking about today is AutoWare.Auto, which is the, the newest and um, best supported version of, of AutoWare. So um, just to kind of give you an idea of like what, how AutoWare, uh, the AutoWare Foundation works, uh, we have a board of directors and we have a technical steering committee. Um, also not shown on this that we have a strategic planning committee. And so those two committees are kind of the high level uh, leaders of AutoWare and decide you know, what's gonna happen with AutoWare. And then um, we have an operational design domain based development cycle, which basically just means like we pick an operating environment and then we add stuff to the software based on what we need to do in that operating environment. And then there are a bunch of work groups and task forces that are completely open to the community. Everybody's able to join those. So if you want to join our software working group or our hardware working group or our operational design domain working group, um, all of those are open to everybody. And please check out Ross Discourse for more information about uh, when those work groups meet. And also there'll be a link to the AutoWare shared calendar that has the login information for each of those work groups if you wanna join. We've got a lot of members. Um, this, this list is actually a little bit out of date, but some big names that you may recognize, companies like AD Link and NXP and LG, uh, Tier 4, one of the original creators, Velodyne LiDAR, um, all of these open robotics, Nagoya University, et cetera. All of these are members of the AutoWare Foundation. And in exchange for their, uh, their membership dues, they essentially get the ability to help mold AutoWare and help make decisions about what features we're gonna target next in the software development cycle. That doesn't mean that you can't add any feature you want to to AutoWare because it's totally open source. It's open for everybody to do it, but we have to have a core group that uh, works on specific functions that we wanna to add to continue to make it grow in uh, a more focused way. So our members really help us do that. So the major current AutoWare projects are AutoWare AI, which is currently uh, in maintenance mode. It's going to be end of life in a couple of years. Um, AutoWare.Auto, which we'll talk a lot more about today, and AutoWare.io, which is really about connecting AutoWare to uh, different hardware platforms and different sensors and figuring out how to make it interact with those in a, in a very simple way, even if that hardware or uh, operating system or sensor driver is closed source. So talking about AutoWare.Auto, um, what is AutoWare.Auto? Because you probably haven't heard of it uh, unless uh, Joe happened to get to you or, some, or you've seen something about it online. Um, if you're in IAC, you probably heard of it because we are providing the, the reference implementation for uh, getting around the racetrack with Clemson University and the Deep Orange 12 team. But uh, just from the name, you may not be able to guess that it is, it is a stack of packages which are based on ROS2. And it is an open source autonomous vehicle software stack. So we long term want to be able to get to the point where we have a completely open source stack that is able to run an autonomous vehicle at level four, which means no human intervention in nearly any scenario. We don't expect level five because nobody really expects level five where you know, the vehicle can take care of itself and change its own tires. We don't, we're not looking to get to that point. But we want to make it functional enough that you could theoretically take it out on the road and do a robo taxi demo with it, go pick someone up and do that without ever touching the steering wheel. So that's the main goal of, of AutoWare.Auto. 
uh, it was developed from the ground up with safety, code quality, static memory allocation, a bunch of documentation and modularity in mind. So with autoware.ai, it kind of grew organically out of some projects created in universities. And with autoware auto, we really wanted to try and focus it and work on the architecture in a way that makes it still flexible, but more focused and, and all of the code has the same quality, all of the code has the same level of documentation, et cetera. So that it is a, a uh, more reasonable product to use, not just in R&D environments, but it's easy to move to a production environment with it. Uh, so the current state of autoware.auto is that we are, we are currently targeting Foxy. Um, we released our 1.0 release targeting Foxy and dashing, but right now from uh, anything past 1.0, we are targeting Ross Foxy only. And we will eventually target Ross Galactic once it comes out uh, next month, I believe. We, in addition to being able to download autoware.auto and build it yourself, you can also uh, use a Docker-based development environment called ADE. And the big advantage to that is you don't have to install any of the dependencies. You don't have to worry about what's on your system. The Docker environment includes everything you need to be able to run both autoware.auto and the LG uh, SVL simulator. Um, and we also support in those Docker environments natively both uh, AMD64 or Intel-based processors and ARM64 or ARCH64, depending on what you want to call it. So we can run on things like uh, an NVIDIA uh, Jetson NX or an NVIDIA Xavier. Those are ARM64 environments. We run on those natively. Um, currently, the major functionality that is supported within Autoware Auto includes things like uh, sensing using point gray or FLIR cameras, um, XSense GPSs and IMUs, and Velodyne PUCs, PUCs lights, and PUC high reses. Now, when I say that these are the supported sensors, what I mean by that is we have drivers built into Autoware Auto specifically to run each of these because there were no open source drivers available for those that were to the quality level that we wanted to be able to run. That does not mean you cannot use other sensors. It just means that if you do use other sensors, there has to be a ROS2 driver available that produces a standardized message type. So for the LIDARs, for example, uh, point cloud two is the standardized message type in ROS that represents a point cloud. And if you have a driver that pro pro provides a point cloud two, the entire autoware stack will work with that driver. Um, in addition to the, the sensing aspects, we also support localization, uh, and that is currently LiDAR-based localization using an MDT matching algorithm. Uh, we will support other forms of localization in the future. Um, as part of our current ODDs, we will be adding GPS-based localization to that, and they will be mutually exclusive. So you can do one or the other or both. Um, we do ground filtering on the LiDAR data using a ray classifier algorithm. We do object detection on the LiDAR data using uh, voxel grid downsampling and Euclidean clustering. And then um, we have vehicle interfaces available, which are either through um, socket can or uh, some other proprietary uh, can interfaces can also produce the same message type. So um, like for example, a Kavasser driver can produce that message type. Um, and then we have a vehicle interface for each vehicle drive-by-wire system that we wanna support. And just recently, a new Eagle drive-by-wire interface was added to Autoware Auto. And that new Eagle interface will work with most of the functions for the IAC race cars because it is using a new Eagle Raptor drive-by-wire system. There are some functions that are specific to the IAC race car and the Deep Orange 12 team is working on a customized vehicle interface, which will support those additional features. But the basic functionality of being able to turn the steering wheel and uh, accelerate and decelerate, that functionality is included in the new Eagle drive-by-wire interface that is already available in Autoware Auto. Uh, and then we also support motion control uh, through either a pure pursuit algorithm or an MPC algorithm. Um, we also have a lot of planning functionality that's built into this, uh, into Autoware Auto, but that really requires that you use a high definition map uh, in Lanelet 2 format. And we don't currently have a high definition map of the Indy Autonomous Speedway track, um, but we will have one soon. The major advantage that that gives you is um, just basically being able to dynamically route from one place to another. 
But if you're essentially looking to follow the same track loop over and over again, uh, that functionality can be done in AutoWare right now with just the waypoint following algorithm. So as I kind of alluded to earlier, our first operational design domain that we targeted was autonomous valley parking. So a lot of the original code was kind of focused on making sure that we could do autonomous valley parking very well. So we use a high definition map and then route through the high definition map to a specific parking spot and park either forward or backward into that parking spot and then return to a drop off point. But the current operational design domains that we're targeting in AutoWare are cargo delivery and racing. And so IEC is part of the racing ODD. Um, that also includes the F110 Foundation, which some of you may also be a part of, uh, which is one tenth scale uh, vehicle racing. And we are working on creating new hardware for those for the F110 system, uh, testing new um, compute platforms for F110, and also making sure that we can run on things like uh, an NVIDIA Nano uh, platform so that we don't have to have like a full-sized uh, industrial computer to run AutoWare. So looking at the architecture for how uh, AutoWare.Auto is laid out based on the autonomous valet parking. Um, we started off with LiDAR processing. So we had, uh, in this case, a front and rear LiDAR, but it's worth noting that any number of LiDARs are supported. You can go from one to a million. And as long as the computer can handle the data throughput, then all of those are supported in AutoWare through Point Cloud Fusion. So we transform the points in, uh, in each of the LiDARs. You start with LiDAR data that's in the frame of reference of that LiDAR. And then in order to fuse LiDAR data from multiple LiDARs, you have to transform those points into some common reference frame. So each of our LiDARs go through a point transformer, which will transform each of the points, in this case, into base link, which is the, the standard ROS central frame for a vehicle. And then we do point cloud fusion, which fuses all of those points from each LiDAR into a single point cloud that contains all the points. Then we do uh, our perception pipeline down here at the bottom. Um, that includes ray ground filtering to filter out ground-based points so that we can do clustering on just the points that are left that are not ground. Uh, so that's done through Euclidean clustering. And then the detected objects from that are passed into what we call the object collision estimator. And we'll get into that a little bit when we get back to planning. The other path for the LiDAR data is once it's been fused is into a voxel grid downsampler. So it's essentially taking each uh, a given space like one meter by one meter by one meter um, in this case, I think we're using something like five centimeters, a very small amount of space. And within those five centimeters, uh, it will look at all of the points that are available and downsample it to just a single point within that space if there are uh, points occupying that space. Uh, the, once the cloud has been downsampled, it then goes into an NDT or uh, essentially nearest neighbor matching algorithm. So we have a point cloud map available, which is essentially a pre-recorded point cloud of the entire area that we want to drive. And we will have one of these available for the uh, Indy Motor Speedway very soon. Deep Orange has been working on that diligently. Um, that point cloud is loaded into a map loader. And the map loader then publishes that full area point cloud. And the NDT localizer takes the real-time data from the uh, LIDARs and tries to match the real-time scan somewhere within that larger point cloud and align it correctly so that you know exactly where you are within that point cloud to an accuracy of about two centimeters. So once we have an idea of where we are, that produces a pose estimate. And that pose estimate goes uh, to two places. It goes to our global planner and also to our behavior planner. So we'll talk a little bit about how our planning stack works. Uh, we start first with, um, giving a goal pose or goal position of where you want the vehicle to be. And that goal pose goes into our global planner. And our global planner then goes to the Lanelet 2 map provider. And this is, again, in the case of the Autonomous Valley parking demonstration and other cases where you have a Lanelet 2 map. It will go to the Lanelet 2 map provider and say, okay, I know that I'm currently here and I want to be here. Now, using the road network that you have defined in that global map, figure out how to get from here to here and give me the list of places throughout the map that we have to traverse to get to that end goal point. 
So the, the global planner uh, makes a request from the Lanelet2 map provider to get the Lanelet2 map and then plans out how to get from one place to another within that map. And that becomes the global route. And that global route get pass, gets passed to our behavior planner. So our behavior planner is what actually figures out how to drive that route within the map. So the behavior planner actually uses what we call sub planners to figure out each portion of the route, uh, how to get through that portion using a set of uh, waypoints. So the behavior planner will look through the route and say, okay, um, for this section of the route, do I need to drive on a lane or do I need to be a parking? And so it will call the individual sub planners to say, uh, here's the section of the, the trajectory or the route that I care about for, for you. And uh, now I need you to turn this route into a trajectory, which includes a bunch of waypoints. The sub planner will then return that to the behavior planner and the behavior planner will aggregate all of those into a full uh, trajectory from, from start to end. And then it will pass that to the, uh, the controller that you're using. In this case, we use the MPC controller and the MPC controller will look at a local section of that trajectory and try to follow it accurately. So the, the commands that it, take, that it gets from trying to follow the, the local trajectory get then passed to the vehicle interface and the vehicle interface then passes them down to the specific drive-by-wire system or simulator that you're using uh, to simulate the environment. So that's kind of the end-to-end the -end architecture of everything that ran within our Autonomous Valley parking demonstration. Now, if you are doing, uh, as I was saying before, like waypoint following on a, a single route over and over again, the lanelet2 portion of this is not required and the behavior planner gets uh, replaced with what we call the record replay planner. So you set up a, a set of waypoints and you can do that by, by just recording the route as you're driving along it, or you can manually input those waypoints. And the waypoints are relative to some origin spot that you pick near where your location is. So instead of having, um, instead of using like latitude longitude, which is, you know, earth fixed, we use a local uh, earth origin. Like we say, this latitude longitude elevation is our origin. So that's zero, zero, zero on our local map. And then all of the waypoints that you record are relative to that origin rather than being relative to the whole earth makes it a lot easier and we don't, you know, overflow uh, float values or integer values or anything with the size and location. So uh, this is an example of what AutoWare looks like when it's doing stuff. This is our uh, marketing video that we created for the autonomous valley parking demonstration. So this was a, a real car that was being driven by AutoWare uh, out in Silicon Valley. We had a uh, safety driver in the driver's seat, but from this point on, he is not touching the steering wheel. Um, you use an app to say, go to a parking spot and the vehicle takes off on its own using LiDAR based localization to drive around. You can see it's driving very cautiously and that was intentional. And then it has a designated parking spot and it reverses into that parking spot. And this is just showing some of the hardware and the sensors that we used on the vehicle uh, while we were doing the demonstration. And then when the user is ready for the vehicle to come back to them, they go back out to the pickup drop-off zone, use the app again to uh, recall the vehicle. And again, the safety driver is not touching the steering wheel. You can see that here. And the vehicle drives back to the pickup drop-off zone by itself. And once it has reached that goal, it'll stop and wait for the user to get in before continuing. All right. So now you're probably wondering how all of this applies to IEC. Um, I'm gonna give a, a quick update on the status of the, the Deep Orange 12 team. Um, unless we happen to have someone here from the Deep Orange 12, I think they were going out testing today, so they may not have been able to join. Yeah, it looks like I don't see anyone on the call from Deep Orange 12. So they were actually going to, uh, I believe, to the Indy Speedway track here today to test. So um, I don't blame them for not being on the call. Um, 
so let's let's go to the base software support task list and that will show us uh, what tasks we're trying to achieve related to IAC and uh, what the status of those is. So um, we needed to move to to supporting Ross Foxy as part of this effort and that's already been done. Um, we AutoWare Auto is, is building completely in Foxy and all of our CI jobs run in Foxy. Um, we decided not to integrate the, the ANSYS VR experience simulation with AutoWare Auto at this time. Uh, that doesn't mean that it can't be done, but given the amount of effort that was required and the amount of time that students will be using uh, ANSYS VR experience to actually do the simulation, um, we felt that the, the amount of time that was left was not enough to do a proper integration with VR experience and be able to make it useful for the teams before they were gonna to have to do their final qualifier. So if you feel that you uh, want to integrate with Ansys VR experience, it's really not super complicated. It's just that we, the, the Autoware Foundation and the people that we're working with to help uh, in Deep Orange 12 combined, we didn't have the time available to do the integration with Ansys VR experience. So we decided instead that we would make a simulation environment available in, L in LGSVL, which can do similar things, not exactly the same, um, and then focus on the integration with the real car so that we have AutoWare Auto available to, to talk to and control the real uh, deep orange vehicle that's gonna be available. But again, if you want to work on the ANSYS VR experience simulation connection to AutoWare, please contact me and I'll give you all the information necessary to do that. Um, so the, the Deep Orange team has been working on a vehicle interface specific to uh, the Delara IL-15 vehicle and the New Eagle Raptor interface that's available there. Um, as I said, there is a New Eagle Raptor vehicle interface already available in AutoWare Auto, but there are some uh, modifications that need to be made in order to support the additional messages that the Deep Orange team is working on. They also need to be able to support uh, GNSS only localization rather than using LIDAR localization because LIDAR localization at super high speed doesn't work particularly well. Um, by the time you've actually uh, matched your current LIDAR data with the point cloud, um, you're you know, 40 to 50 milliseconds behind where you actually are on the track. And given that you're gonna be traveling at speeds of up to 300 kilometers per hour, that simply isn't feasible. So they need a GPS only localization. So they have implemented a version of GNSS only localization um, in their own fork. And I will give you a link uh, to that fork in the chat, but um, the, uh, the version that they have implemented was done fairly quickly. And it was, um, we have some fairly stringent requirements on documentation and code quality that uh, are required to merge things into AutoWare Auto. And because this was done under like really bad time constraints, um, the, the GNSS localization exists, but it's not quite up to the standards that we're looking for to include in AutoWare Auto. So in their fork um, on their uh, deep orange branch, there is a folder under source localization, GPS only localization. And this is where they implemented uh, the, the GPS only localization node that they use to read the GNSS data and then use that to localize the vehicle. Um, they developed this also in Python. And one of the requirements for AutoWare Auto, since we want to be able to be real time, is that we can't accept nodes written in Python. So um, for inclusion in AutoWare Auto, uh, this has to be converted to C++. Um, but it's, it's worth going and looking at their code. Um, you can use their code as an example. And uh, if you're interested in helping to include GNSS only localization in AutoWare Auto, uh, please come to our, AutoWare soft, our autonomy software working group. And we'll be happy to talk about our future plans for how we're gonna include uh, GNSS lo only localization in AutoWare Auto. And that'll be available in four weeks-ish? Approximately, yeah. So we have a, uh, since we're working on the cargo delivery as our, our primary ODD, um, we actually have some issues that follow uh, specific high level functions like localization. And this issue for the cargo ODD localization, uh, this tracks what we're currently doing in the localization space and a diagram of how we plan to implement our entire localization architecture for part of this. 
So we'll have a combined EKF that's doing uh, filtering on the position estimates, and that will take inputs from uh, CAN bus, wheel encoders, IMUs, GNSS, and the LIDAR uh, localization pipeline. But again, this is all in progress, and you can see a bunch of issues here linked uh, for individual parts of that. And then uh, in order to support being able to loop the same pre-recorded route over and over again, uh, record, record Replay Planner needs the ability to loop uh, a given route, and that currently doesn't exist. Um, again, the Deep Orange team has kind of implemented their own version of this, uh, but it is, uh, again, based on the time constraints, not quite up to the quality level that we're looking for for inclusion in Autoware Auto. So we'd be happy to work with someone to uh, enable looping in the record replay planner. And then outside of the tasks associated with uh, improvements to autoware and things that need to be added to autoware, there were a handful of tasks that need to be made just in general for ROS2 to be fully supported in IAC. Um, we needed a, a drive-by-wire driver from uh, New Eagle Raptor, and that has been completed. It is not only available in this repository, it's also available in the ROS, uh, ROS build farm. So you can, in Ubuntu, for example, sudo apt install ROS Foxy Raptor DBW ROS2, and that will install all of the packages for the driver for the new Eagle Raptor drive-by-wire system. Um, we, I think the, the uh, radar drivers are still in progress. Um, there's an NDA associated with those that has to be signed for the, the interfaces to be available. So I believe Neil from RTI and um, Apex AI are currently working on implementing those ROS2 drivers for the radars. Um, but they will not be fully open source when they are done. They will be something that the teams will have access to, but they will not be available on like a public GitHub repo. Uh, and then that is also the case for the LiDAR driver. Um, Neil from RTI has been working with uh, the LiDAR provider to get access to the API. Again, it requires an NDA to be signed to, to view the, uh, even the API. And he is working on uh, a ROS2 LiDAR driver for that. Again, it will not be open source when it's finished, but it will be available for, for teams to work with from IAC. Um, for the cameras, uh, there's the Mako camera driver. Um, these are from the uh, Allied Vision cameras. And the Mako is the, um, uh, the type of camera that's being included. And Vimba is the SDK that you use to access that, those cameras. So um, once again, Neil from RTI has, been, uh, has finished a driver and that one actually is open source. So you can go look at the uh, AVT Vimba camera driver from Neil RTI. He made a fork of the official one that's hosted by Autonomous Stuff. And he has merged in ROS2 based changes. So this can now be run in ROS2 and receive frames from the camera. Uh, there is also um, synchronization with the precision time protocol uh, that can be added to this driver. And that, that part is currently still in progress. And then uh, additionally, for the GNSS system, um, a Novatel GNSS uh, ProPack 6, ProPack 7 is being used. And there is an open source driver from Swiri Robotics uh, that is the, the most up-to-date one available for um, the Novotel GPS systems. And this supports a fairly large number of uh, messages. But the primary ones that you'll be caring about are the, um, the NAVSAT fix messages. And those provide the, um, the actual estimate of latitude, longitude, and uh, uh, information about the deviation and the standard deviation for each of the measurements and so on. Um, there are a lot of topics and uh, messages that are produced by those systems. So you'll see a huge list of the, the publications here that are being published by that driver. Um, we also needed a socket can node so that Linux socket can uh, could be supported in order to do CAN communication between the, um, the Raptor DBW ROS2 driver and the physical hardware that's connected to the Raptor drive-by-wire system. And so um, there is not a, a good ROS2 port available of the, the socket CAN API. So autoware.auto already had a, um, an implementation of ROS2 socket CAN available as part of our code base. 
So instead of keeping that as part of AutoWare Auto, we made it a completely separate package that you can now uh, download either from the AutoWare Foundation GitHub or you can install it directly from, uh, from the ROS build farm. So you can run sudo apt install uh, ROS foxy ROS2 socket can. And that will get you this package, uh, which allows you to connect to a socket can device on, uh, on one of the AV link computers or any socket can uh, device that you can have available. Um, the Deep Orange team will eventually be releasing a Simulink model, which will control the uh, state machine for the shifting in the, the Delara vehicle. And um, they're still working on tweaking that. They haven't had a lot of testing time on the real vehicle. So once they get that fully tested, they will release that Simulink model. And then you'll be able to release a uh, ROS2 driver from that Simulink model through uh, MathWorks or through um, uh, MATLAB and the ROS, uh, ROS toolkit for MATLAB. So that will produce a working Foxy compatible driver for the, uh, for the shifting algorithm in the Delar vehicle. And then um, we've also created a work group, which you may have heard of on the town halls, uh, called the uh, base, support soft, or base Software Support Work Group. And as part of that work group, we will be setting up uh, calibration instructions for the cameras, um, working out time synchronization with the Deep Orange team, and a whole host of other tasks to make sure that when you get the vehicle, you have a base set of already pre-configured hardware and software that is the same for every team. And that you don't have to worry about trying to calibrate the cameras or calibrate the LIDARs or do any of those tasks. It'll just be ready to go for you to communicate with all of the hardware when you get the vehicle. So at a high level from, um, uh, from an autoware standpoint, those are the major tasks that we need to complete for the software side. There are also some other tasks that are related to IEC. Uh, we have those ta uh, tracked in a milestone in auto, auto or auto. And those include the, the looping capability for the record replay planner, um, the ANSYS interface package that I was talking about, and creating a Lanelet 2 map for the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Now, this can be done. Um, it doesn't, you don't have to actually collect data on the track in order to do this. It does help with accuracy, but you can create a starting map from uh, just satellite imagery. So you can go to Google Maps or use Bing imagery and the uh, JOSM tool and create a basic Lanelet 2 map um, to be able to use some additional features within AutoWare from like the uh, the lane edges um, to be able to do uh, some path planning algorithms based on the lane edges. So this is a task that we would like to complete, but it's not super high priority since the uh, waypoint following really covers most of the functionality that we need for the, for the IAC um, autonomous race. And feel free to add uh, new issues. If you find bugs within AutoWare or if you find features that are missing that are necessary for the Indy Autonomous Challenge, please create an issue for that. Um, however, if you're looking for support, we recommend going to Ross Answers. So answers.ross.org is where Ross Answers is located. And there is a, uh, an AutoWare tag that you can add to your questions, which will um, flag it so that one of the maintainers of AutoWare uh, sees it come up on their list. So you can see here that we've got, um, you know, several hundred questions associated with AutoWare, and we have answered the vast majority of those to the best of our ability. So if you have questions related to how to run AutoWare, how to start it, how to configure it, um, any of those things, this is really where we recommend that, that people ask questions. Um, but if that gets elevated to, you know, we actually found a bug or we actually found a feature that we want to add, then we create those issues on, on the AutoWare GitLab. So if you're interested in contributing, uh, the list of issues that we're currently tackling are available there. That includes the IAC issues. Um, if you have never contributed to an open source project before, this is a link to a really good uh, repository on GitHub that teaches you how to use Git and how to clone down the, uh, make a fork of the repository, clone down the repository, make a change to it, push it back up to Git, and then make a merge request to merge those changes excuse me, into GitHub. 
And we follow along with that process as well. And I'll show you in our documentation kind of uh, where, where that process is documented. Um, we also have a, a Slack uh, server. So we have a large number of channels dedicated to specific topics on Slack. Um, again, we do ask that you use Ross uh, answers for support, but if you wanna start a discussion with people on Slack, please feel free to join there. And you can also direct message me, uh, Josh Whitley on Slack, if you have specific questions about your implementation. And then we also have our own category on Ross Discourse. Um, if you head over to uh, Ross Discourse, this is where you would post like long running discussions or um, questions about uh, you know, how to implement large architecture changes. This is where we discuss our large architecture changes. And we also post the meetings from our technical steering committee and strategic planning committee here. Uh, this is also where we would make uh, high level announcements about, uh, about AutoWare, although we usually copy those to Slack as well. Um, and then if you are a university that's interested in joining the AutoWare Foundation, uh, we do have a, a, an education and uh, government group uh, membership type. So you can email auto at autoware.org if you're interested in joining the foundation. And then um, just a few useful links. Uh, we'll start with the, the courses on Ross and AutoWare. So um, about a year ago, the one of our primary premium members at the time, uh, Apex AI, worked with AutoWare and some of our um, con other contributors and the uh, Open Robotics Foundation to create an excellent series of, um, of courses which are available in a playlist through this link. So this starts out, uh, go ahead, Joe. Just can't recommend it highly, highly enough. It's a 14 core series. And if you haven't already been through it, um, you should. Yeah, so this starts with everything from like our development environment, which is the, the Docker based uh, ADE environment that I was talking about. Um, this is an excellent course. Uh, it's an hour and a half. So it's, um, it's more data than I was able to include in my first hour of this of this course. But uh, it's all about ROS2, and it gives you a step-by-step -step walkthrough of uh, how to use the command line tools, how to write your own node, um, how to make modifications to existing nodes. It's a really great comprehensive course hosted by uh, Kat, who is the developer advocate for, uh, for ROS2 in the Open Robotics Foundation. Um, and then there's a bunch of information about ROS2 tooling, um, development tools that you can use on ROS2, um, hardware platforms, real-time operating systems, uh, DDS, um, a bunch of autonomous driving stacks that are available out there in addition to AutoWare Auto, um, the basic AutoWare 101 course that I gave, which is just a high-level overview, um, some of the same slides you'll see from the beginning of this course. And then it digs deeply into object perception based on LIDAR, based on camera, based on radar, um, state estimation, um, the use of the LGSVL simulator with AutoWare, motion control, data storage and analytics, and HD maps. So it essentially covers everything that's within the AutoWare auto stack and more that's not yet included uh, in autonomous driving systems. It's a really great set of courses. Um, Ross answers I already mentioned, uh, filing issues I already mentioned, and then the AutoWare docs are, are the last thing I want to go through. Um, the AutoWare docs are auto-generated from the code and also from uh, documentation data that we produced in like markdown files. So in the AutoWare docs, uh, there's a basic introduction to AutoWare Auto, information about the project itself that leads to our website, um, the functionality that is currently supported, um, sounds like we might be getting some feedback from someone. There we go. Uh, and then how to get started. So starting from installation of AutoWare Auto, either with or without ADE, we support both installation methods um, using the LGS, LGSVL simulator, and then on to usage, which includes uh, the full demonstration that we did in Autonomous Valley Parking, as well as like using that in a simulation environment and then general demos for individual pieces of the AutoWare stack and how to get each of those running. Um, we have support guidelines, which talk about how to get support um, using ROS answers, using ROS discourse, setting up uh, GitLab issues, and then talking on Slack. 
And then under building, we have information about how to uh, build ADE or build Auto or Auto yourself and make modifications to it, both inside and outside of ADE. We also have a design section, which includes um, design documentation for uh, each part of the AutoWare stack. So if you look at, for example, common, and you look at like the covariance insertion node, for example, there is a comprehensive design document about how the uh, function works, how it's implemented, and um, what each of those uh, uh, what each of those functions mean, and in some cases, even even examples of how to use the functions that are available within that uh, that portion of the code. And then we have a really comprehensive contributors guide that talks about guidelines and best practices for creating code within AutoWare Auto, um, how to develop your code within a fork. So this is that that stuff I was talking about on on contributing to open source, um, how to actually create the fork from the AutoWare Auto repository how to make changes to it, how to make merge requests, et cetera. And then um, how to handle errors, how to write integration tests, and IDE specific configurations for uh, things like CLion. So if you're using the CLion IDE, uh, this is a full documentation on how to set up CLion to work with both ROS2 and AutoWare Auto. And then of course we have uh, complete API documentations our documentation from all of the classes that we provide within AutoWare. So if you're looking to um, use some of the, the joystick vehicle interface, for example, uh, here's the documentation for the joystick vehicle interface, the class itself, each of the functions that's within the class, and then all of the parameters that each of the functions expect. All right, um, now we will move on to that uh, second Q&A that we were talking about. And it looks like there are a large number of questions in chat. So I'll try to get to as many of those as I can. Uh, let's see. Just speed, just speed. Responses. Um, so Bonolo, uh, who is our project manager for the AutoWare Foundation, also posted a link to a Lanelet 2 paper that talks about the, uh, the HD mapping format that we use in Lanelet 2. So it's, it's really worth um, taking a look at that if you're planning on using the HD map functionality. Um, I'm going to butcher some of these names. I apologize for that. Uh, for David uh, Rigamonti, how much accurate is dynamics modeling in LGS VL Simulator? Um, so this is something that's kind of a hard question to answer because the, the vehicle dynamics uh, is based on a plugin. So you can add your own plugin to control the vehicle dynamics of the uh, simulator. So it kind of depends on which plugin model you're using and, with, and how accurate that, that model is to the actual vehicle. Um, I know that Clemson and the Deep Orange team are working with uh, SVL at the moment to try and get a very realistic model um, they're having a little bit of trouble. Uh, there's also another university that's involved. I think it's um, University of Hawaii, Maui. Uh, they're having a little bit of trouble at the high speed, making sure um, that, that the model is completely accurate, but uh, they're, they're getting as close as they can. Um, Johannes, did you have uh, something about that? Yeah, yeah. I just want to add um, that it's based on the unit Unity's physics X engine. Mm -hmm. So you can search for that, or I can just post a link inside here. And then you see all the parameters that are currently recommended from the vehicle dynamics point of view. But it's the same as Josh stated. It's like a very good vehicle physics dynamics setup we have currently in the LGS wheel. But of course, parameters are not uh, defined so well that it's super accurate. So we are actively working on that to make it as accurate as possible. And once the, the dynamics have been updated to get as close as we can get to the real model, those will be released as part of the LGS VL simulator. So they will go on uh, the open source version of the LGS VL simulator and be available in, in their assets. And uh, Johannes, um, you there? <laughs> so which IAC team are you? Uh, I'm IST <laughs> team to Munich, of course. <laughs> the but uh, tell them the other thing that you're working on for the F110 community because I think it's going to be quite useful. Yeah, um, I'm currently working at the University of Pennsylvania, and we are offering a one to ten scale vehicle, autonomous vehicle. Uh, 
um, that we can recommend if teams are interesting to work with a car, uh, then this might be a very good setup because we are currently uh, transferring all the way or auto from the big car to the small car. And that gives you the possibility to um, test your algorithms. Um, I will share an additional link. Um, so we are working very closely with Oddware and try to give you as much as possibilities to test your algorithms. Yeah. And you may be wondering like how things will translate from, from the real car to the, to the race car. And uh, there, there are a lot of functions that are very similar between the two. And we offer the ability to customize, uh, for example, your MPC controller or your, um, uh, your planning algorithms based on the dynamics of the vehicle that you're running it on, but the core code is exactly the same between the two. So if you're trying to plan uh, a line around a track, you're gonna end up planning in the same way that you would on the full size track on a small track. It's just that the vehicle dynamics and the control algorithms are slightly different. Um, so let's see, Siddharth Saha uh, asked, is robot localization being considered for the sensor fusion? Um, with regard to GNSS IMU nodometry. So robot localization is not currently in consideration for our uh, localization algorithms. And that's mostly because um, we are writing the algorithms to be as close as possible to being ported for real-time applications. And the robot localization code is not quite uh, to those standards that we're looking for for inclusion in AutoWare Auto. Um, we are looking at what we can utilize from the Navigation 2 stack and uh, I still need to have a meeting with Steve uh, Masinski from from um, uh, Panasonic, I think, or Sony. I apologize. <laughs> uh, Sa Sa Samsung Research, Samsung. and he's the Nav2 work group leader. Yes. So um, I still need to have a meeting with him about the crossover of functionality between uh, AutoWare Auto and the Navigation 2 stack. Yeah. But we will be looking at what we can utilize from Nav2 and also uh, improvements that we've made in AutoWare Auto. If we choose to move over to a portion of the Nav2 stack, we will port those improvements from mm -hmm. AutoWare Auto to the Nav2 stack. Yeah. So well. Steve and his Nav2 work group are just absolutely killing it. They've got the super active community, over 100 contributors. They've added Ackerman steering. They're just doing so much great work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. So Steve Cox, please explain more about not using Python for the development of nodes. So this is a, a requirement that's very specific to AutoWare Auto. Um, Python is a great language for being able to quickly iterate on things and uh, put together code in a fairly quick fashion and also has a very uh, large and active code base of modules that you can use kind of out of the box. The downside is that it's an interpreted language. It is something that has to run through an interpreter and is converted into inter an intermediary language for compilation and running on the system. Um, because of that, and because C++ is a pre-compiled language, C++ is more suited to real-time systems than Python by its nature. Um, there are some real-time extensions that are available for Python, but the APIs that are available in ROS are much more extensive and support real-time functionality more on the C++ API than they do on the Python API. Yeah, so, Josh, this is Steve Cox. I, I get you on that. I'm a C++ developer too. Um, sure. What I'm getting at is, is that, are you saying that anything that runs within the ROS, I'm AutoWare Docker that we want the team wants to implement needs to be in C++, but we can- No, have no, definitely not. Role. Um, so if you're developing it for IEC, if you do not plan to merge it back up into AutoWare Auto, you are completely free to run it in Python. The, uh, the Deep Orange team, as an example, has done uh, probably 40% of their nodes in Python and not in C++. And they run perfectly fine. They're perfectly interoperable with everything that's in AutoWare Auto. It's just that the core AutoWare Auto modules have to be in C++, at least for the node-based code. I got you. I, I'm I'm thinking about higher level, lower frequency, forty thousand foot yeah. modules that uh, uh, occasionally uh, inject something into the system, and it's so much easier to write something in Python as opposed to uh, the C plus plus. So it would be for lower frequency uh, uh, use cases. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that totally makes sense. And we in in AutoWare Auto, we have uh, a set of guidelines about what can be included and what can't. And C++ is specifically for core real-time nodes. Um, and the 
if we if we accept a node, it needs to be in C++, but stuff surrounding that can be in Bash or Python. So if you're writing like a script that does visualization of some of the data that's already available in Auto or Auto, we're totally fine with that being in Python because that's not part of the real-time system that's controlling the vehicle. Um, so it's a little bit flexible and a, and a, a little, uh, you know, hard to kind of draw the line. But um, if you make a merge request and your, your node is written in Python, uh, we will ask for some justification for that versus putting it in C++. But that doesn't mean that we won't accept the merge request. Gotcha. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So, uh, so unlike Gazebo simulations, it seems that L uh, SVL messages, even standard types provided by ROS2, are not directly viewable over RViz2. Is there a reference in Auto or Auto to see how they combat this? So one of the things that we have in uh, kind of the base layer of Auto or Auto is vehicle interfaces. And we have a vehicle interface that uh, connects to Auto or connects to LGSVL and then turns those into the messages that LGSVL is producing either into uh, ROS2 common messages like odometry or um, a handful of others, uh, or it turns them into autoware specific messages. Mm -hmm. So some of the messages you can view directly out of uh, SVL. So like the, the LiDAR data is published in Point Cloud 2. Uh, the position estimates are, are posted in um, odometry messages. So you can view those directly in RViz. But there are other things like the, the, the wheel position and the, um, uh, some of the dynamics data about the vehicle that, that they have to really be in uh, a custom message type that is not directly supported by RViz2. And so um, we either convert those into a more standardized message type or we, we convert them into an AutoWare specific message type. There are a lot of messages within AutoWare um, that are not standardized ROS message types. And that's because we have to represent things that are not very low level pieces of data that can be standardized and available uh, uh, as visualization in RViz2. But you can also create plugins that visualize pieces of information uh, that are not in standard ROS2 message types. So we've created a plugin, for example, to show trajectories that we create coming out of the planning algorithms. So you can visualize those trajectories as like a little string of arrows, and it shows you the, the velocity associated with each arrow. Um, and, and we're totally happy to accept merge requests that visualize other pieces of information that we currently don't visualize within AutoWare. But the main interface to those, um, those messages is usually through like the ROS2 command line utilities. So ROS2 topic echo, ROS2 topic hertz, and then also the RQT uh, framework. So RQT graph is a node that has been ported to ROS2, which allows you to say, I wanna subscribe to this topic and I wanna graph the value, uh, this particular field within that topic. So I want to graph both the X and Y position uh, on a complete 3D graph in, in RQT. You can do that. There's also a tool called Plot Juggler. Um, I haven't verified that this is, uh, this is available in ROS2, but I know it was in ROS1. And that provides kind of a more complex um, plot uh, GUI for, for talking about ROS2 data. <laughs> It's next to impossible to understand you. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, feel free to, uh, to post in the, yeah, in the chat. That'd be appreciated. Um, so as I said before, it, uh, after we get finished with this and the, the video has finished processing, we will offer links to the video. Um, we're probably going to put this on the AutoWare YouTube channel, uh, and then we will post a link to that in Slack and also on Ross Discourse. Um, and we will send an email out to, to some of the team leads as well so that they can distribute it. Um, let's see. Okay, so Joe posted a link in uh, in the chat about how to use ROS2 on macOS, and that was produced by uh, by a friend of his, and it's on robotandchisel.com. So if you're interested, uh, there's a there's a decent tutorial here about how to run ROS2 on macOS Catalina. Yep, it's it, and I just mentioned it because it had come up earlier in the call. 
Um, so with Galactic, it's being demoted to tier three because there's not enough support for the, from the community, um, but there is uh, a lot of use in the community. And so, you know, uh, in fact, you know, much of what we do, things like Cyclone DDS, like is developed on uh, M1 Mac OS. <laughs> And it's worth noting that uh, they are they are just about to the point where they have a functioning Ubuntu distribution for for Mac OS. I know. How exciting is that going to be on the new M1 laptops? Yeah, that'll be great. And uh, AutoWare also supports the ARM architecture. So once that's available, we should be able to directly compile for, for the M1 uh, platform. Yep. Yeah, we've got some new ARM stuff coming out that, you know, if, uh, uh, if IC extends beyond um october uh we have some interesting architectures for you and even if the iac uh does not extend beyond october we really hope it does but if it does not we we are the foundation is still committed to working with uh clemson the deep orange team and the rest of the iac community to make sure mm -hmm. that the changes that you guys have made um and that the deep orange team have made to autoware are put into a form where they can be merged back into autoware yeah we uh we think that those the, those functions are really useful, and we would love to see those uh, available as core underwear. And there's a right now our big work streams around um, autonomous racing are F one tenth and Indy Autonomous Challenge, uh, and you know some of the other communities within this are your EV Grand Prix Autonomous Run Out of Purdue, your SAE Formula Student Driverless, and if you draw the Venn diagram of who's doing what, there's huge overlap. Like you know I, I sponsor University of Hawaii; they do all four of those racing leagues, right? And that's probably true for many of you. Um, the uh, and me sponsoring Uniswai has nothing to do with them being five minutes from Kite Beach in Kanaha. Mm -hmm. um, so the uh, so EV Grand Prix, we see all this work that we do together on IEC that's going to very quickly is happening now. It's going into uh, some of the EV Grand Prix teams. Um, I expect SAE Formula Student Driverless will uh, follow shortly thereafter. All right, so uh, last call. Uh, does anyone else that is on the call wish to, to ask any questions? Um, if you did, weren't able to type them into chat, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask them at this point. I guess we have an in-person train scheduled through Hawaii then. They are going to host us there. Is that correct? Coming up. I think you're That's muted, absolutely uh, true. Gary, sorry, go ahead. I said that's absolutely true. <laughs> For I'll, I'll be first week of May. <laughs> I heard we can all stay at Gary's beachfront house. Se second week of May now, Joe, so we're going there. Okay. Hey, Josh, I had a couple of quick questions. Does the GPS capability include like RTK, if you have that in the game? Absolutely, yeah. So the RTK is usually handled at the hardware level. Um, the uh, GNSS units that are being used on the IEC cars are uh, Novatel OEM 7s, and they do support RTK both over um, uh, the over an internet connection, which is what they're going to be using for the Deep Orange vehicle, and also over a uh, uh, um, a radio connection. I'm failing on the name of the radio protocol right now, but. Um, yeah, they do support that. And then those corrections uh, are applied to the data that comes out of the GNSS unit. So the, the data that you receive in AutoWare will already be G, uh, GTK corrected if you have those corrections, RTK, excuse me. Okay. And then do you happen to know, I don't know if Johannes is still on the call, but do you happen to know when you might have a test version of AutoWare for F110? So the, the F110 stuff um, has kind of met a couple of roadblocks recently with regard to porting auto or auto. Um, it has to do with the, the software that's available in ROS2 for talking to the F110 hardware. So in general, the F110 vehicles use, um, use speed controllers uh, from a line called VESC. And there was a ROS1 driver available for the VESC uh, speed controllers, but there was not a ROS2 port available. So uh, we started to do a ROS2 port, and then we found out that the serial communication mechanism that was used in ROS1 is also not available in ROS2. So we had to develop a whole new serial interface to be able to talk to the VESC. Um, that part has been done, and now I'm working with uh, Jack Silverman and some of his students to uh, 
implement that serial interface into the VESC driver so that we can finally talk to the, the hardware on, uh, on F110. And so once that is done, we'll actually be able to put AutoWare Auto on um, an NVIDIA drive in X, which will be able to uh, communicate with the, the, the F110 hardware and we'll actually start to formally do the port. So would you think by September or like very broad brush? Yeah, I would say, I would say September is, is quite, uh, I, I would expect it within the next month to month and a half. So probably by mid June, we should be well, uh, we should be able to at least run the vehicle around with a joystick using AutoWare Auto. Interesting that you mentioned September because the goal for the AutoWare slash F110 or scale robotics is that we can start our classes in September using it. So September is the magic date, but that means before that, way before that, we should be already developing and testing it and then be running. Yeah, let, let's get it done before summer so that we can iterate through the summer and start classes in the fall. Well, I'd it. like to have it available for when we have a race here in the Detroit area and bring Jack and the UCSD guys and Reiner from Germany over and have some fun. Uh, oh, yeah. Sign, sign me up. We Not to, to drag this much longer, we just got a notification for UCSD that we can start to go back, we can start to get some travel going, so I'm working exactly as I type this in that. Cool. Hey, last question, Josh. So, and as far as the hardware stack on the F one tenth is concerned, I think we touched on this before, but just to reconfirm. So, if you want to run like with a, a depth camera or something like that, there's a way to go about running out of where just to, based on a cam construct instead of mandatory lidar. So the. There are currently not nodes included in AutoWare to be able to do that, but the functionality past the, the localization input is there. So what I mean by that is um, the, there's a driver, for example, for like the RealSense camera that will produce um, a right, point right. cloud. And you can do a lot of the same processing functionality on the point cloud. So if you pre-drive the route and record a point cloud, which that functionality already exists in AutoWare Auto, and then you use the real sense driver, which produces a point cloud. You can then use the NDT matching function that's already in AutoWare Auto to match your location to the pre-recorded pre, uh, pre point cloud. So, so uh, David, that, that, that's, a, that's one of the goals, right? So a lot of people that use the scale robot that we can see on a screen may not be using the LiDAR. So we have to figure out how to support that. So there is um, an effort that the AutoWare Auto is open up for the public, the discussion of the hardware design and support. So it's coming up, Dave. So I'm totally part of this thing of, of developing this to be affordable for different versions of hardware. So it's coming up. So soon we're going to be publishing some of this the roadmap there. So I'll just mention a couple of things real quick before we uh, shut down the call. Um, there is a hardware working group if you are interested in helping with the um, iteration of the hardware for the uh, cargo ODD and for the racing ODD. Joe is uh, one of the, the co-chairs of the hardware working group. Um, and there also will be very soon a racing working group that will be specifically focusing on IAC topics and F110 topics in regard to autoware and how uh, managing the implementation of that functionality. With the headquarters in Hawaii. <laughs> With the headquarters in Hawaii, sure. <laughs> we can say that since it's a virtual call. All right, um, thank you everyone for joining. We really appreciate all of you coming to our, uh, our call. The slides and recording will be available soon. And we hope to see you all at Indy in October. Actually, we'll, we'll see a lot of you at Indy next month. Yeah, certainly. Thank all right, you everybody. Very much. Play Thank safe you. so we can play longer. Bye. Bye-bye. Talk to you later.